So for years, we could see that mobile industry was growing steadily. There were new ad companies coming uh, with ad new solutions. Users were playing more and more games, and they were spending more money. Dev companies were growing in numbers. And then, boom, during pandemic, we went through the biggest growth in the history. But COVID is over now, and it's getting harder. We hear about layoffs. We hear about, hear about privacy changes, about shrinking UA budgets. Does it all mean that UA is dead? I hope not, because this is what I do for a living. Um, during this presentation, I will walk you through the current state of user acquisition and mobile uh, industry, and also we'll touch base on the future from, um, from privacy perspective. And you heard it right, the future, because I think that uh, user acquisition is not dead. My name is Magda Zaremba, and I'm UA manager in Aptic. Uh, I worked in the marketing for nine years now, seven if we count only mobile marketing. Uh, I gained majority of my experience in one of the biggest gaming companies in Poland, Huge Games, when I, where I worked in different marketing departments. Recently, I moved to the other side, and uh, right now I'm part of the US startup Aptic. So Aptic is one of the leading brands focused on growing games. We do both uh, UA services and technology. We have team of user acquisition, creative department, and also analytics team. On the other hand, we have engineering team that supports us with building uh, relevant tools uh, for UA team to optimize the activity on a daily basis. We use also uh, data modeling for iOS so we can uh, make right decisions for our uh, iOS activities uh, for our, our clients. Here are a few examples of the companies that we've worked with for years. Uh, Axie, Candy Rider, um, Mino, GSN, recently also Titling Point. Um, but of course, there are many, many more. But let's get down to business. So we hear many negative narratives uh, in UA space. User acquisition is dead. You can't scale on iOS. Android is too expensive. The biggest game companies stopped spending, or that it's at least what we hear. Uh, Google Privacy Sandbox is going to ruin UA on Android. Are they all true? Are they false? That's something I will try to find out during this presentation using both uh, public data, but also uh, our internal data from our clients. So what happened recently? We could see a lot of privacy changes happening uh, throughout the last uh, two years, worsening uh, financial macro conditions around the world, gaming first, uh, gaming first uh, contraction, and also mo massive consolidation. Uh, I think one of the things that has the biggest impact on our industry is uh, our privacy changes. So with SCAN and ATT, which became our bread and butter, Traditional MMP uh, data no longer tells us the, the whole picture of our UI activity, of our investments. Uh, so we have to use kind of uh, modeling to understand how they be behave in longer perspective. Many large companies are scaling, scaling back the budgets. And also, Google uh, Privacy Sandbox is on the horizon. And we don't, don't know too much about it. Even though we tend to think that ad spend continues to, uh, to uh, that ad spend started decreasing for uh, gaming uh, companies, it looks like it didn't. We st still see positive trend throughout the last two years. Uh, so let's take a look at Android. Android um, is, was increasing steadily until the end of 2022. Then it slowed down a little bit and uh, stabilized on similar level throughout 2022. For uh, iOS, the situation is a little bit different. It's less stable. Uh, after ATT implementation in April 2021, we can see a slowdown uh, in the trend. It looks like the advertisers needed some time, two quarters, to adjust to the new situation uh, after uh, privacy changes. And then the, they started uh, the, the trend um, speeded up again. After the bump during holiday, holiday season, Again, for iOS, the situation, uh, the trend, lines, uh, trend line for iOS looks very similar as for uh, Android. Um, since AI chatbots are now on everybody's lips, I decided to invite it, I invited to our discussion today and I asked it a few most difficult questions 
to see what it uh, has to say about it. So this is the first question that I asked. Does mobile game ad spend continue to increase? And this is what uh, our friend Bart uh, said. So according to a report by Data, Data AI, global game, mobile game, uh, global mobile game ad spend reached 136 billion dollars in 2022, up 11% year over year. Uh, and it is, it's both for Google Play and App Store. And so basically, it looks like our investigation, uh, based on App Store data, uh, was confirmed by uh, Chatbot Bart. Now let's move to other two charts, uh, also from AppSlayer uh, marketing report from this year. I find them very interesting and complex, and I think that there is no one answer for any question. So let's start for cost per install uh, for both Android and iOS. Uh, we'll focus on Android, uh, the purple line for tier one countries. I think it's more relevant if we compare um, Android um, CPIs to iOS if we take into consideration only to one country. So for uh, Android, last two years were quite stable. We can see increase uh, of 17% uh, throughout those two years, uh, which is relatively stable, especially if we compare it to iOS. Uh, so for iOS, the situation uh, looks like this. It's 88% increase throughout two, two years, uh, sorry, in Q1 2021 and uh, uh, finishing in Q4 2022. Uh, we see the first increase after ATT implementation in April 2021 uh, when it started increasing drastically. Then it stabilized after two quarters and again it started growing in the second part of 2022. As I already mentioned, there is no one uh, answer why it happened. There are many reasons. So first of all, ATT, of course, the, all the privacy changes. But also we see that uh, Investments in hyper casual they are decreasing, and as we know, they have they tend to have very high scale and very low CPIs. So if we replace them with uh, RPG titles and um, puzzle titles, which have uh, three to even ten times higher CPIs, obviously we can see uh, average CPIs increasing. Now on the second chart, we can see paid gaming app install trend when it comes to volume. So again, for Android, the situation is quite stable. They're increasing quarter over quarter. Uh, it may be caused by many things again, but I think one of the biggest issues, issues uh, reasons why it's increasing is because uh, we see um, rapidly increasing scale in emerging uh, markets like um, uh, South America and also Asia. Uh, for iOS, again, we can see big drop in trend uh, after ATT implementation and also uh, stabili stabilization after uh, for throughout two quarters and then increase again during holiday season. And then again, the trend uh, slows down. Uh, I would also uh, put the blame on the uh, changes in the market, but not only ATT, but also uh, the fact that we are not spending so much uh, on, um, uh, on hyper casuals. Here we can see data from um, Sensor Tower. It's uh, revenue driven by, by in-apps uh, for both iOS and Android. Uh, what is very interesting, both Android, iOS and Android, they reached their heights during pandemic, then uh, it decreased significantly. Uh, if you take a look, I don't know if you can see, but this is billions of dollars. So the small drop is around $1 billion, so quite significant. And it never reached back to the same uh, level as before during the pandemic. Uh, and what I find quite interesting is the fact that if we see this drop in revenue, but still increasing spend on iOS. So the question that I ask myself, if advertisers are still making money uh, on their iOS uh, investments. For sanity checks, uh, we uh, pulled some data also from our Optic platform to see how it uh, changed for our clients uh, throughout the last two years. And uh, we see that uh, both trends look very similar. For, for iOS, we can see uh, increase, very significant increase uh, in CPIs after ATT implementation, then stabilization during 2022, and uh, again, a little bit of drop at the beginning of the year. For Android, the costs uh, are steadily increasing. Additionally to CPIs, uh, I pull also data for CPMs. This is something that I think will help us understand uh, how it's uh, uh, working for iOS. So 
After ATT implementation, the CPMs for, uh, for on iOS, they doubled. We can see this pink bump here. Then they stabilized and started decreasing at the beginning of this year. For Android, they're extremely stable. And I think it's interesting uh, if we take, take into consideration that if the IPMs stay the same level and uh, we do a lot of uh, creative work to, to, make, to, make it, uh, to make them stay at the same level, uh, we can assume that uh, it may be one of the costs why we, co we could see the increasing CPIs for, for our clients. So, uh, knowing the how CPIs are increasing and also taking, uh, taking into consideration that uh, uh, iOS users tend to spend and, uh, more and bring us big, bigger value than Android users, we have to think how to invest in smart way on iOS. So here we can see um, RPU ratio, uh, um, iOS RPU as ratio of Android RPU. So for every dollar that uh, Android user brings us, uh, Android users bring us, um, iOS user bring us two to even 3.5 uh, more money, which is a very big difference. So. We have to remember that uh, iOS users are still there and still they bring us uh, bigger uh, uh, values because of the privacy changes, they didn't change their behavior. So it's worth finding the right way to invest in iOS. There are of course many ways to use, um, mm, uh, to use scan um, tools in order to build your own methodology, how to buy profitably on uh, on iOS, I will quickly uh, tell you how we do it on uh, in Aptic. So in Aptic, we take the whole cohort of the users uh, that uh, we generated with our UI activity. From from this, we take only um, player, players who opted in. So we have all the MM data in MMP in old-fashioned way, and we model their behavior on uh, scan users. In this way, we are able to see the uh, predict full LTV for all the cohort. And one more question that I still haven't answered is if the big company stops spending uh, on UA. Mm, so there is no clear answer in my opinion. We hear a lot of um, news, we read the headlines uh, on LinkedIn, on blogs, uh, we listen to podcasts and we keep hearing different uh, um, approaches from different companies. So, for example, our Airbnb here announced that uh, they will move uh, performance marketing budget to other activities like branding, for example. Yplaytica uh, uh, recently announced that they will not spend uh, on UA for new projects, but they will focus on the, most, on the projects with the biggest potential. Um, but we have to keep in mind that if big uh, players stay, uh, they remove their budgets from from uh, from the market, it's also bigger opportunity for us, for smaller advertisers, to invest their money there. Um, and again, I uh, invited our friend Bart to say something about it, since I couldn't find the right answer and one uh, straight answer for my question. So the question that I ask: uh, Have the biggest companies in the mobile gaming industry been decreasing their spend on UA? And this is what he said: There is some evidence to suggest that the big players in the mobile gaming market have stopped spending on user acquisition. For example, a report by Sensor Tower found that the top 100 grossing mobile games in the United States spent $2.5 billion on UA in the first quarter of 2022, down 11% from the same period in 2021. So it kind of confirms that uh, the big players, they stop spending on UA, but as I already mentioned, it's opportunity for us. Okay, I think we can sum up the first part of the presentation with the current state of the market. So, uh, ad spend is increasing on both platforms. CPIs are increasing slowly on Android, but drastically on iOS. But I think it's worth keeping in mind that it, it was um, average for iOS. We have to check also more, more detailed information about the genres that are interesting for you. Advertisers didn't totally shift the budget from iOS to Android. Still, iOS users, they tend to behave in different way than Android users, so advertisers are aware of it and they still want to acquire those. iOS volume growth slowed down significantly while Android is steadily increasing. Okay, so now 
many of those were caused by two factors, the COVID and also privacy changes. And since COVID seems to be behind of us and uh, privacy changes are ahead of us, um, let's move to the second part. And I will talk a little bit about the future from a uh, privacy changes perspective. Um, we talk a lot about scan. We know how challenging it became, be, became to um, analyze data to check whether our investment on iOS is profitable or not. Uh, and uh, for so far, for example, with ScanFree, we have only uh, one postback that uh, will show us um, uh, activity of the user within 24 hours, which is super short. And for majority of verticals it's not enough to assess the performance. Mm. So scan4, uh, from more general perspective, scan4 works with uh, iOS 16.1 uh, and above. Uh, adoption rate right now uh, is around 80%, uh, which is quite solid. So from user's pers perspective, we are ready to use uh, scan4. But of course, this is not, not the only uh, thing that has to happen for us to start using all the features that scan4 brings. So, um, what else has to happen before before we start using SCAR4 as an advertiser? So first of all, MMPs, they have to build the infrastructure that will support us to measure or measure all the postback uh, sent by uh, SCAN4. But also the networks and publishers, they have to update the, uh, their MMPs SDK. And we are still very far away from this, so it's still ahead of us. So what Scan4 is and what it means for, for advertisers. So there are four main changes uh, coming with Scan4. Multiple postbacks, increase of conversion window, improvements to source identifiers, and attribution web to, uh, to app. So first of all, uh, with Scan4, uh, we'll get three postbacks in three conversion windows. With Scan3, right now, we have only one postback in, uh, which we receive after 24 hours. So it's already uh, revolutionary for me because we'll be able to see longer, uh, long term, uh, long long term um, progression of our users. So, uh, so how it will work in in practice? So uh, the first post back will cover day zero to two and will be sent after 24 hours to 48 hours delay. Then we had the second post back, which will cover day three to day seven, and it will be sent after 24 hours to 144 hours, which means that delay will be between one to six days, which is quite uh, long. And then we, we have third post back, which will cover day eight to 35, and it will be sent with delay of 24 to 144 hours as well. Um, what is also interesting that for, for post postback one will work more or less as um, as it works right now with scan free. So uh, if you already figure out how to work with with scan in the right way, probably you will keep the first postback as it is. Uh, the additional thing that we'll get uh, will be course conversion value, which means that we'll get a general idea for the cohorts that are not that didn't pass the threshold. So it's great because, um, and it, it is especially important information for smaller advertisers with uh, uh, not significant, significant uh, user acquisition budgets or for the, our new activities that we start testing because we will not have to pass the threshold in order to see how, how we are going. It will not get the exact number, uh, the revenue, but we'll, we'll get the signal, for example, that uh, our activity brings a slow or medium or high value. But the uh, bad information is that the course value is also uh, the only thing that we'll get for postback two and postback three. For those two, we'll not uh, get the exact numbers, we'll get only the idea if we're going in the right direction. Uh, in practice, we'll have to build four conversion schema uh, for free postbacks. Now we can move to uh, improvements to sor source identifiers. With scan free, we got two digits, so we got information on media source level and uh, campaign level. While for scan four, we'll be able already to see four digits and we'll be able to see much more granular data like creatives, for example, or ad set um, level. And I think it's uh, it's very exciting. However, 
of course, um, will have to pass the thresholds. Uh, so it will happen only if we have a big scale uh, on our activity. And the last thing is attribution web to app, um, which doesn't exist in uh, for for scan free. So scan four will give us a chance to attribute uh, web to app traffic uh, and in practice measure search campaigns. Apple wouldn't be Apple if it didn't complicate things a little bit. So as I already mentioned, there are two main things that will uh, make our life um, less happy as we could expect with all the new features. So first of all, randomness. As I already mentioned, there are the postbacks are sent with a quite big delay, especially a postback two and postback three. Six days of delay is already a lot, and especially that it's random, so we are not able to track from which day the postback is coming from. It will make uh, modeling very difficult. And the, the other thing is threshold. So with Scan4, Apple introduces uh, postback data tiers. Uh, so it depends on how big the cohort of the users that we acquire is we'll be able to see more or less data. And also, we'll be able to see much more for postback one than for postback two and postback three. So how can you prepare to, uh, for scan four? First of all, you can already update your MMP SDK. So uh, you will be able to at least see the partial data coming from scan four. Uh, think about building conversion schema for the second and the third postback. Uh, prepare on how to define low, medium, high value users and start talking to the media partners and MMPs if they work uh, um, on any uh, new solutions, if you can be part of any beta or the tests. Uh, I think it's always valuable to be part of them. Um, while Scan is right behind the corner, Google Privacy Sandbox uh, is relatively far away from implementation. The, uh, for now, plan is, I, I think, for the second part of 2024, so we still have a lot of time to, to get ready, but I think it's always better to start earlier than later. Um, so the, the goal of, this, uh, of the Google Privacy Sandbox is to add features to the platform that will allow us uh, still run uh, performance campaigns, but uh, at the same time without using uh, device ID. So the personal data like device ID, but not only, uh, should stay on the device. So we'll be able to use it, but it will not be processed. It won't be sent to the uh, third data, data uh, companies uh, or, to, or, or to the servers. There are more four main elements for Google Privacy Sandbox uh, topics, attribution reporting, fledge, and SDK runtime. I think from our advertisers' perspective, two, two, two first are the most important, but I will touch base on all of them. So let's start with topics. Um, how many apps do you use on a weekly basis? Who uses up to 10 apps? Who uses up to 20? <laughs> Who uses up to 30? Who uses more? You guys you have to be <laughs> in one of those groups. <laughs> Okay, we have shy uh, audience. Uh, so, uh, from now on, each app for Android will be uh, mapped with a list of the topics. So, for example, imagine travel app. Uh, it will be mapped with topics like travel, food, entertainment, uh, I don't know, some, something else. Um, and uh, your device will uh, will convert the history of the apps that you use for, uh, for the last week to the list of uh, to the list of top topics of the week for each user and uh, from this perspective we will be moving from um, targeting users to targeting audiences so how it will work from advertisers perspective first of all advertisers uh, will use the topics to determine uh, the audience of their interests. So we'll no longer be interested in people, like users, uh, singular, but we'll be interested in audiences with uh, similar behaviors. So the ad network will push uh, the request with set of, uh, with set of uh, rules, uh, topics, but maybe something else, to the devices, and it will wait for the response of the devices, whether the user uh, meets the requirements or not. If it does, 
then the ad will be served. In this way, Android removes the user level identifiers and topics are selected entirely on the device. Uh, today, marketers rely on advertising ID um, to be able to evaluate the user acquisition activity and the investments that they do. Of course, with a Google Privacy Sandbox, it won't be possible any anymore since we will not be uh, using uh, user data. So reporting for Sandbox will be very similar to Scan4. Uh, there will be no more real-time um, unlimited reporting. We'll get two types of report, event-level uh, event level report and aggregated reports. Event-level report will be based on click ID. And aggregated reports will be uh, will show us uh, campaign data like uh, campaign name, date, uh, creative, um, geo, and I think something else. Uh, and of course, there will be uh, thresholds, so we'll be have to uh, pass the threshold for all the data in order to see uh, more granular information about the audiences that we acquire. Uh, there will be free postbacks shared in free conversion windows. So first one will be sent on the two. The second will be customized uh, by the advertisers. We'll be able to choose uh, one um, one moment, one day that will it will be sent uh, at, up to day 30, and the third one will be shared after uh, one month. Um, and what is more. To add some spiciness to reporting, of course, uh, Google decided to add some randomness. They call it noise. So uh, they will be adding some additional Unreal uh, postbacks. So we'll not be able to track down the, uh, the postbacks. And now let's move to Fletch. Fletch is a solution for retargeting. So uh, even the fact that it exists is already uh, very exciting because Apple, after two years of uh, ATT, after ATT, ATT implementation, they still don't have any solution for retargeting. So, of course, we won't be able to build very, uh, very specific audiences for our targeting activity. Uh, but at least we'll be able to show more general uh, retargeting ads to our uh, to the users who engage with our app, apps. And the last one. It's very technical, but I'll try to explain in a, uh, in a easy way. So SDK and runtime, uh, it will protect the device from other SDKs to collect data from your device uh, that they shouldn't collect. So from now on, SDK uh, runtime will be the guard, uh, the one who will decide which kind of information other SDKs should obtain about the user or about the device. So how can you prepare to Google Sandbox? Um, first of all, you can register to beta and start testing it from user perspective. Um, in February, Google released this beta and already all the users uh, can opt in and check how the topics are generated, how you can opt out uh, or remove some topics from your list, how uh, they change week over week. So even though it's not, if it's not dedicated to strictly to advertisers, you can see how it works. Um, you should stay alert and observe what is happening in industry. I always recommend to listen to podcasts and uh, talk to, uh, to other people who already have some thoughts or maybe some um, um, their work more directly with uh, Google. Because Google is very open to feedback when it comes to Google Sandbox. Uh, they work with the biggest ad tech companies and, uh, and they uh, receive feedback from them. Uh, they consult uh, the changes. So before they roll out the Google Sandbox, uh, they want to be ready that it works uh, well. And you should increase your focus on data science since um, uh, you will not see any more data after uh, one month. Uh, so data modeling will be extremely important for your activity. We're coming to the end, so let's uh, take a look at the questions that we asked at the beginning. Is user acquisition dead? I think UA is alive and well, but we have to be agile and we have to adapt because it's changing and it's getting more and more difficult. Can you scale? Uh, you can scale on iOS. You can scale on iOS and you should because the good quality uh, traffic is really there. But you, for now, you will need a good strategy and modeling layer. And you have to keep in mind that it's uh, changing, the CPIs are increasing. Android is too expensive. Uh, Android costs actually are increasing gradually, according to the reports that we uh, could see. 
the biggest game companies stopped spending. Uh, some companies uh, did, some, uh, some are evolving, they're moving the budgets. Keep in mind that if some of companies are uh, stopping the spending on, uh, on UA, this is a great opportunity for other advertisers uh, to, to allocate their budgets there. And privacy sandbox is going to ruin UA on Android. It's getting harder, be ready to adapt. I think it, everything will be good, but we have to be ready to, to change uh, the way we think about UA. And this is the last question that I ask our friend Bart. Will privacy changes ruin user acquisition? Privacy changes are not going to ruin user acquisition. They will simply change the way the user acquisition is done. Business will need to adapt to these changes in order to continue acquire users. I want to thank you, my expert Bart, who helped me during this presentation, and also want to thank you. Okay, thank you very much again. And now we can pass to short Q&A session. If you have questions, please raise your hand, and I'll give microphone. Um, thank you, my name is Hannah Epps Flyer. Um, I just wanted to ask you, uh, how many customers of yours are testing Scan4 right now, and with the, which media sources, and what are the preliminary results, if you could share? Thank you. We're, we're not really testing Scan4 yet, because uh, uh, networks and publishers, they're not ready yet to pass the data, so we don't have any signals yet, but it's uh, in near future. When the first ATT was rolled out, we uh, adjusted very quickly, so I hope when we start seeing the signals, we'll be able to adjust also quickly for here. This one, since it's only another layer to previous scan, it will all um, show us more signals, more data, but the base will stay the same. Thank you. <laughs> Any other question? Do we have address on, on in the conference room? <laughs> Anyone? No? Okay. So, thanks again for the third Thank time. You. And we can finish now, I, I believe. <laughs>